Hi teachers, I'm Kristen Caudell. Happy end of the year. I'm so excited that you have decided to spend some time with me today as we are celebrating successes of learning across the county at all levels. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the math reasoning routines that I found success with both in my classroom and in the digital classroom environment. Welcome to my classroom at Emma K. Daub Elementary. This is where the magic happens in math and science thinking with our magnet students in fourth and fifth grade. So if I were giving our time today an essential question, I would say it's this. How can teachers facilitate dialogue and discourse to promote critical thinking in the virtual classroom environment? But first, let me tell you a little bit about me. I am a teacher of math and science to magnet students in grades four and five at Emma K. Dab Elementary. A proud teacher mom to two busy little boys. And I would also include a side note that I am in desperate need of a solo vacation. Just kidding. Seriously. So let's get started. Why is thinking and reasoning important? We know that students who can make sense of mathematical ideas can apply those ideas in problem solving, even in unfamiliar situations, and can use them as a foundation for future learning. Without them, students are reduced to rote learning and often experience frustration and failure. So over the last two school years, the math department has offered professional learning opportunities after school uh, where you can go and learn about uh, ways to support students in their mathematical thinking, um, especially through tasks that promote uh, modeling and reasoning of mathematics. So last year, um, in one of our PDs, Angie had shared a resource called Fostering Math Practices, and within that resource are several reasoning routines that you can use with students um, that are based off of the math practices, um, but they become great ways of um, reinforcing those ways of thinking about mathematics and making connections between ideas, um, persevering through challenging um, story problem situations. Um, and these routines um, are something that I dabbled with a little bit last year and then this year I really dug in um, and did a lot of them with my students in class prior to the pandemic situation. So uh, my students were already familiar with them, and we were able to tweak them slightly and continue using them in our online learning. So I want to share with you a couple of those routines um, that I've really found success with, and I want to share some of the student work and thinking that has come out of using those routines. Um, and the beauty of some of these are that they don't necessarily have to be done live in a Zoom situation. Um, they can be part of a pre-recorded lesson, um, and you'll still be able to elicit some excellent mathematical thinking um, and reasoning from your students without being face-to-face. -face. So, uh, the, the three, or I'm sorry, the four routines that I want to talk to you about today that I found success with are three reads, capturing quantities, decide and defend, and then there's a thinking protocol that was not part of our math PD learning, but something that um, is often done with gate students in, in the magnet world um, as we think about uh, different types of thinking, and that is called the Socratic Seminar. So those are the four that I'd like to talk to you about today and just tell you how I've found some success with them in my classroom. So these are the reasoning routines that I want to talk about today. Three Reads is an instructional routine designed to develop students' ability to make sense of problems by deconstructing the process of reading mathematical situations. Over time, students will internalize this process, thereby creating a heuristic for reading and making sense of mathematical story problems, which comes from Math Practice 1. Capturing Quantities is an instructional routine designed to focus students' attention on important quantities and relationships in problem situations. The goal of the routine is to develop students' ability to reason abstractly and quantitatively, which is math practice too. 
Decide and defend is an instructional routine in which students make sense of another's line of mathematical reasoning, decide if they agree with that reasoning, and then draft an argument defending their decision. The routine fosters Math Practice 3, construct viable arguments, and critique the reasoning of others. And then there's the Socratic Seminar. This is a formal discussion based on a text, or in my case, um, based on a story problem in which the leader asks open-ended questions. Within the context of the discussion, students listen closely to the comments of others, thinking critically for themselves, and articulate their own thoughts and responses to the thoughts of others. So the first routine I want to look at today is the three reads. In this routine, first you're going to launch the routine, um, which is talking about the problem and just engaging interest with the students. In the first read, students are going to understand the context. They're going to think about what the problem is about. In the second read, students are going to interpret the question. They're going to think what question or questions are being asked in the problem. In the third read, students are going to identify important information. This could be important quantities um, or relationships that are given in the problem, or it could be important information that is needed yet to solve the problem or what they will be figuring out. And then finally, in all of these wonderful routines, they end with a reflection on thinking. So in distance learning, I have used the three reads routine um, in pre-recorded math lessons. Um, I share a graphic organizer with my students and in my pre-recorded lesson, I read through a complex story problem uh, related to a specific skill or concept uh, three times. And after each reading of the problem, I remind students of the question lens through which they are thinking about the problem before they attempt <coughs> excuse me, to solve. So they have heard the problem three times and they have thought through it in three different ways before they begin working on the problem on their own. On the graphic organizer, they record their thinking for each column so that I can see what they're thinking and what they're understanding even before they begin their work. And then I have them solve their problem on paper and upload a photo of their work. Let me show you some examples. So on this particular student's work, you can see the graphic organizer and how they recorded their thinking after each reading of the problem. And then they actually have the problem in print and they solve it on paper and then upload a photo of their work. I prefer the photo just because I think it's important that they're continuing to put a pencil in their hand and um, be able to make models and diagrams and represent quantities and relationships. Um, and so many of those things can be challenging to do on the iPad. So um, for that reason, I love um, when my students are able to solve it on paper and then upload a photo. In this particular student, you can see where they rephrased the question, um, summarized what the options were, and then they showed their work and the model that they made in order to arrive at their answer, which they represented with um, numbers and symbols. The next routine I want to show you today is called Capturing Quantities. So in this routine, uh, you are going to launch your problem, similar to the last routine, and the goal here is reasoning quantitatively. Um, so in this routine, you are really focusing on identifying quantities and relationships within a problem. Um, so in this step, what you would do is you would share, discuss, and annotate the problem. Um, in step three, you're creating diagrams, so you're showing arrows and symbols, um, things that represent the process, um, operations that represent um, connections between um, different uh, quantities that are given in the problem. And after the diagrams are created, you discuss the diagram and then um, solve and reflect on your thinking. So uh, let me show you a capturing quantities lesson that I did with my students recently. So in this problem, 
we're going to think through some of these questions before we get started, and then we're going to create a diagram of this problem. What can we count the number of here? What can we measure? What's an important quantity, or what's a relationship that we know? Well, we know that each class has 23 students, and we know that there's two classes. That's important because that's giving us the total number of students. So how would I figure that out? What operation would I need to use? Or what operations could I use? Because I think you could probably do it two different ways. We also know that in the science lab, each table will seat four students. So how many tables are they going to need? What if there's not an exact number of students to fit at an exact number of tables? Then what are we going to do? Let's go ahead and think through this. Let's take it out to the driveway and use some sidewalk chalk to figure it out. So I grabbed some sidewalk chalk from the garage and headed out to my driveway. Here I drew two classes, two groups of people, um, and I labeled each one as a class because there's two classes working together in the science lab. Next, I've labeled each class group as having 23 students because that's an important quantity. There's two classes and 23 students in each. So what am I going to do to figure out how many all together? Well, I'm going to add 23 plus 23, which would be the same as 23 times 2 for a total of 46 students all together. Now there's four students per table. So how many tables am I going to need for 46 students? What operation am I going to use? I'm going to divide. 46 students divided by four tables will mean how many tables are needed. So I'm going to use my partial quotient or long seven strategy. I've taken away a group of 10 fours, which is 40, which left me with six, and then I took away another group of four which left me with 2, and when I totaled up my partial quotients, I got 11 with a remainder of 2. So what that means is, they're going to need 12 tables to fit the 46 students, because if they only got 11 tables, then there's going to be 2 students left without a seat. So we'd need 12 tables. So now, of course, I want to show my work as stacked equations. So the first step that I took was 23 times 2, which gave me 46 students. And then I had 46 students divided by seats of 4, which gave me 11 remainder 2. It's always important to interpret the remainder. You wouldn't want to say you need 11 remainder 2 tables. You would say, I need 12 tables for those two classes to fit in. So let's take a look at some of the work that the students produced after solving a problem on their own. You'll be able to see how they represented quantities and relationships using a diagramming process in their own work independently after going through that routine together. The next routine that I want to talk to you about is called Decide and Defend. My students love this routine when we were together um, in the physical classroom um, this winter when I used it with them for the first time. So this is a great routine for having them critique the work and the math reasoning of someone else. Um, so I gave them a complex problem. I believe it was one of the exemplar tasks that are located on the math portal. And um, they solved it one day, showing all of their mathematical thinking. And then the next day, they got someone else's work. And they had to decide whether they agreed with that person's work and wanted to defend it, or whether they disagreed with the work. And again, they would have to defend why they disagreed with the work. Um, so they looked at it as an opportunity to be math lawyers and to prove whether someone um, had a uh, accurate representation and correct answer and um, had explained all of their mathematical thinking. Um, so the students loved it. Uh, I used a routine very similar 
in one of my online science lessons um, a few weeks ago where I had my students um, critique a gravity investigation uh, presentation that their peers had made. Um, they chose someone to critique and they basically evaluated the work um, looking at the strength of the claim that they made based on the evidence and reasoning that they provided for their claim. So you can easily use this routine in a um, math setting, which is what it was originally designed for, or it could easily be tweaked for other uh, subject and content areas as well. Again, super engaging because the kids love the chance to um, to evaluate and look at the work of someone else, but then to also get their own work back and feel validated or have the opportunity to go back and fix the work given the feedback that was provided by their peer. So um, definitely one to stick in your toolbox to give a try in the future. The final routine that I want to talk to you about today is called the Socratic Seminar. I met my students for a live Socratic seminar in Zoom last week, and it was a really engaging way to get them thinking more deeply about their math reasoning. Let me tell you a little bit more about what a Socratic seminar is first. So a Socratic seminar is a great thinking routine to get kids thinking more critically about a topic. Um, in math, I used this routine uh, a couple of weeks ago with my fourth graders, and this is a routine where you break your students into two groups, and they have a claim or a question or a topic um, to which they have prepared some sort of um, response or notes, um, some kind of evidence or reasoning that they're um, bringing to support whatever claim or juncture that they've made. And um, the two groups are going to each have a turn to talk. One group um, that if I were in my classroom, they would be sitting in chairs in a circle. They would be considered my inner circle. Um, they would have a set amount of time where they could discuss openly um, the question or the claim or um, you know whatever topic they had come prepared for. Um, and during that discussion time, they are taking turns speaking, they're being respectful to one another, they're answering um, the question with reasoning and with support, they're staying on topic, they're asking each other questions, agreeing or disagreeing respectfully. Um, and while this is happening, the students on the outside circle who are standing around with a clipboard and probably a graphic organizer or a recording sheet of some sort, they're active listening actively listening. They are remaining silent because it's not their turn to talk. Um, they're monitoring the conversation and maybe organizing ideas that they're not hearing that they want to be sure to include in the discussion. Um, and then halfway through, the tables turn and those who were seated in the inner circle get to stand up and be part of the outer circle. And the outer circle has a seat and they are um, now the inner circle, and it's their turn to discuss the question or the topic or um, the math problem, in this case, um, that I did with my students. So um, we use Zoom to meet virtually, and I made it an optional activity. All of my students answered um, reflection questions about their math thinking um, from the assignment on the day before, and they submitted that in Google. Google Classroom for their work for the day, but then there was the optional Zoom where students could come and engage in the Socratic seminar to discuss their work um, through this protocol. So um, I had um, a fair number of students show up. Um, we broke into two groups and the inner circle um, had their discussion based on the reflection questions that I had prepared for them ahead of time using the responses that they had prepared ahead of time. And um, meanwhile, those who were on the outer circle, they were interacting in the chat feature of the Zoom room, and they were discussing, you know, who was being an active listener, who was doing a great job making sure everyone's ideas were being heard, you know, who was um, including people who hadn't had a turn to speak yet. So um, it was great to see those kinds of observations being made um, about the discussion itself. And then after a period of time, we switched and those who were um, muted in the outer circle were then given the chance to have their discussion and those who were 
originally in the inner circle became the outer circle and they moved, um, muted themselves and then moved to the chat and they began to observe um, different things that were happening during the discussion. And then in the end, we all came back together and reflected on the math learning that um, was evident in our, as a result of our thinking routine um, in that Socratic seminar. Um, it was neat to hear how some students made different connections that they hadn't realized before or were maybe introduced to a different way of um, representing quantities in their problem or um, a different process or operation maybe that was used, but they still arrived at the same answer. So um, it was neat to see those solution paths um, come together um, in a way that they realized whether their answer was accurate or if they had um, some sort of error, they realized what the misconception was and um, were able to learn from that too. So um, it was a really neat experience. Even um, it's always fun in the classroom, but it was great to see the students be so excited to engage in that kind of thinking routine um, around their work as well. So for me, that was a major celebration. So to wrap things up, I just want to take time to thank you for spending some time with me today to celebrate the learning of my students um, and how they have continued building in their math reasoning skills through these um, protocols and routines. Uh, I do want to leave you with a slide of a website that you can visit um, where you can access these reasoning routines that I mentioned earlier, as well as Google Slides. Um, presentations with all of the steps for each of the routines so that you could easily implement them with your students um, in the digital learning environment or when we're face to face again. So highly recommend taking time to check them out. Um, I'm going to leave my email here if you would like a, a copy of the slideshow um, so that you can access the links. Please feel free to send me an email and I'd be happy to share it with you. I hope you have a wonderful summer break. May it be restful and relaxing, and I hope you have a wonderful school year. And if you can take a vacation, do it. I know I will. <laughs>